Hey there. We wanted to let you know that we'll be having conversations about trauma in this podcast. So please take care of yourself while listening. Hey, everyone. I'm Jamila King, and this is HBO's Last Call podcast, the official companion podcast from Max, Story Syndicate, and Pineapple Street Studios. Last Call, when a serial killer stalked queer New York, is a production of Story Syndicate. The four-part documentary series tells the story of how in the early 90s, at a time when homophobia, hate crimes, and the AIDS crisis were on the rise, a serial killer preyed on New York City's gay men. Most true crime stories focus on how victims died. This is a series about the lives they live. This is episode four, Fred. If you haven't seen all four episodes, check them out before you listen to this show. In this episode, I'll be in studio with historical consultant Nikita Shepard to discuss their work on the show and to present us with a history lesson on the gay and trans panic defense, which Richard Rogers successfully used in his 1973 acquittal. I'll also be speaking with lawyer Chase Strangio from the ACLU to discuss his work on litigating, organizing, and being a spokesperson for the queer community. But before we get to those conversations, I want to touch base with series co-creators Anthony Corona and Howard Gertler. Anthony directed all four episodes, and Howard was the executive producer and showrunner for the series. First up, welcome back to the studio, Howard. Jamila, how's it going? It's going well, and welcome back, Anthony. Hi, hello, Jamila. Hi, hi. So I'll start with you, Anthony. How are you feeling now that the show and the series is done and the world is watching it? It's definitely surreal. Um, You work so hard on something and then to have it released to the entire world is very intense. Um, But luckily, the reviews and I think the audiences that are watching have received it in the most incredible way. I am so thankful by the response the show has gotten thus far. So it's surreal, but also I'm just beyond thrilled by the reception. And how are are you feeling now that the show is done? Very similar to Anthony. And, you know, I come from a feature film background. This is actually my first series. And Story Syndicate, our partners on the show, they've definitely, you know, been to this rodeo before with a lot of amazing shows. And... When you make a feature, you know, especially if it's like a documentary feature, you bring it to a festival, you screen it, you see how people respond, some reviews come out. Like it's incremental in terms of understanding what's going to happen by the time you launch it, however you launch it. With a series, you make it with your network and we had amazing, you know, creative partners and production partners in HBO and of course, you know, Story Syndicate being part of the team and getting a sense from their feedback and guidance of of how to shape and craft this. But you literally have no idea how people are going to respond until like you get reviews the day before you start airing. And, you know, we put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this one. And uh, I think we're just grateful that our intent with the show was received the way it's been by critics and audiences and also all the detail that went into it. You know, people are picking up on, and that's really uh, gratifying. You've said before that you wanted this series to focus on the victims and their lives, their relationships, and their communities. What were the conversations you two had about refocusing episode four, or at least part of episode four, on the killer? We wanted to give enough background into the killer's life that people feel like they can grasp who this person was, but we didn't want to give enough to make it feel like we were sort of doing armchair psychology or trying to do some sort of a sympathetic lens on him as a person. So we just wanted to give the facts and move on to the victims and how the families of the victims were affected rather than sitting on some deep exploration of who this person was. I think for some people, it's it's a very interesting thing. For me, it was not the most interesting thing in telling this story. So it's just how I decided to tell this story and Howard. Yeah, I mean, we had a lot of conversations about this. And Elon's book, which I encourage everyone to read, you know, goes more deeply into Richard Rogers' childhood and background and all that. Um, You know, the spine of the story that we're telling in the show is still the investigation and the resolution. And, um, you know, Richard Rogers' arrest and trial is part of that. Mm -hmm. And we were not interested in having people on the show hypothesize about why he may have done what he did, who didn't know him or hadn't worked on the case. 
We did try to see if any, like, psychological exams were run on Richard Rogers when he was arrested in um, 2001, between then and the trial, and there weren't. Um, Interesting. So we did a little bit of poking around why, and it seems both the prosecution and the defense ultimately were not interested in, in doing that. But we felt like his prior arrests and cases do provide some sort of perspective on his life and who he was, but also on the nature of the institutional Mm -hmm. failure that we've spent the whole series analyzing. So in many ways, the show was building up to what we've done in this episode. So you talked about how you wanted to address Richard Rogers' motives. How did you decide to talk about Richard Rogers and his own sexuality as to whether it, you know, pertains to the crimes or his personal life? Like, how did you decide to bring him into the story? This was definitely the thing that we toiled over the most, the thing that I, like, I lost sleep over because it, it was, I knew it had to be done very sensitively. And so there were a lot of conversations about how we we address Richard being gay himself. And we wanted that exploration to come out of other queer people and to also, you know, talk about how making it a big thing and making a meal out of Richard's sexuality really does not hold systems accountable. And so we wanted to really have the conversation and then move on from it. And I I think we really did that. I'm very, very proud of how we handled it in the end because I know how much care and time and consideration went into that conversation. And I think Matt actually explains it well in the show. We are never going to know. I don't think the real motivation for these murders, but I'm not sure it matters to the story that Richard Rogers was gay, other than being gay helped explain how he was able to get his victims to go with him and meet their end. And and that really does help Mm -hmm. to summarize, I, I think, our perspective as well. You know, I do suspect that as a gay person, he would have known how institutions make queer people vulnerable and how to insinuate his presence into queer gathering places. So I think in that way, it was important for us to identify him as gay. Uh, And there were cultural signifiers that were found in his apartment. We talk about it. Hush, hush, sweet Charlotte. Golden Girls. (laughs) Dynasty. You know, Dynasty. And we were interested in that because, you know, the investigators didn't seem to know what this all added up to. Mm-hmm. We found hundreds of Golden Girl episodes, each a separate episode. And, uh, and when I saw it, I go, what the? Who would want the Golden Girl? I didn't even know what it was. I, 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 it's like something his mother would watch, I would think. I, I don't know anybody young that watched Golden Girls, do you? You're probably too young to even remember it. I've seen them all. <laughs> <laughs> And we knew what it added up to, and we felt actually it was just important to vocalize it in as much as it was important to talk about these other things. But, you know, the fear is when you create a show like this, if you identify the killer as gay, the takeaway from an audience might be, this is what gay people do. This is part of the deviancy. And, of course, that is not true. That's slander and libel. Uh, So walking the tightrope with this was very, very, very tricky. You were able to fit so much story into both the documentary and the podcast. Are there other stories that you still wish you could have brought up in either one of those forms? In doing this through our historical advisor, Nikita, who's in this episode, um, and everybody that worked on the show, they did such exhaustive research on anti-queer violence. And in doing that, you just realize the number of victims, the number of incidents, the number of horrific things that have been happening to queer people forever across the country and across the world. There's certainly a lot of instances of anti-queer violence out there that could also have four-hour explorations that um, that do show homophobia within the system's in this country. And and I wish we could have gotten into all of them, but we just couldn't. Yeah. I mean, one antecedent that we talked about when we were developing the show that people have asked us about and wondered why it wasn't talked about is the movie Cruising and yes. the murders that yes. it was, you know, what inspired the movie Cruising were a series of murders of gay men in the mid 70s. And, you know, Jeffrey Schwartz, who's a brilliant filmmaker, is making a whole documentary just mm. about that. Mm. So people can see it there, but there just wasn't space to bring it up. But we do talk about the Ramrod murders and 
Uncle Charlie's bomb. So, you know, there were, there were so many different cases to pick from. We could do that. I think, you know, David Wertheimer um, shared a really telling anecdote. You know, he was able to sort of give us more about the origins of the AVP. We could have done a whole two-hour special just on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I, I think also, you know, the first six months of doing this, I would spend and Howard would spend eight, nine hours a day just going through all of the archival that our archivists were pulling. And there could be, I think, like an amazing four hour film that's just like, look at the platform that mainstream media has given extreme homophobia. Um, And we couldn't include, and you know, most of that. But it was eye opening for me to see just yeah, just the, the amount of homophobic ranting that has been on on mainstream TV since the, the dawn, dawn of TV. TV. <laughs> well, it's an, I remember we got like I remember we got uh, an archival tape and the slate. You know that whoever the oh my archival God. owner you That's know right. puts on the head of it, it had a gay slur to describe the news segment. Mm-hmm. Wow, and you know that might have been something that was created. God knows when, but I was like, "Yeah, what do we do with this? Like, maybe we include there's, but there were just again. I think we've included so many examples. People get the point. One of the best things about making this show is that we had this incredible, incredible historical researcher and advisor, Nikita Shepard, who sort of walked us through queer history and would come into the Story Syndicate office. Uh, and sort of set up shop and teach the team about whatever we needed to learn about for each episode. It was incredible. Uh, and it was sort of like I was being paid to learn. It was one of the best parts of making the show, for sure. So this series was quite heavy and must have been really intense to create. So I want to know, where were you able to find moments of joy in this process? I mean, there's a lot of joy in talking to the families, and especially at the end of interviews that were so intense to have them say, this felt very cathartic for me. Those were moments of joy. But also, you know, I don't know if it comes across in the podcast, but I am a very boisterous kind of big person, and I want laughing in the room. I want, like, I poke fun at Howard. Howard pokes fun at me. Like, I I think... Myself, Howard, our team cultivated a joyful experience of making the show around dark content. Um, And that was definitely, I think, saved all of us from sort of going to really dark places during the making of this. We had a lot of funny people on the team. We had a lot of moments of laughing, a lot of warm moments. And yeah, I think we kept it very, very light when it didn't have to be dark. Yeah, I mean, we would go into Story Syndicate like every day and there was just this joy of the collaboration. Literally, like every person on the show was really curious about the story and how it could have happened and what it meant to go through this footage. And there's like a, like when you're making a documentary, you are writing the show every day. You know, it's, it's this very iterative process. Yes. Yeah. And so there's always like the thrill of discovery, even when you're like locking picture, like you discovered something new about that. Yeah. So I would say the lightness definitely came from our team. Yeah. I, I hope I would be so lucky to like have a team as amazing as this one has been because they've just, you know, whoever I work with in the future has very, very, very big shoes to fill because they all were just remarkable. Next, I'm speaking with Nikita Shepard, historian, researcher, historical consultant, and a PhD candidate. They study, teach, and research LBGTQ history at Columbia University. Nikita, thank you for joining me in the Story Syndicate office. Thanks for having me, Jamila. Nikita, you have prepared a literal history lesson for us on the gay and trans panic defense. We are the students. You are the teacher. You ready? Sure. The gay panic defense is a strategy used by defense attorneys who are representing clients on charges of murder or other violent attacks. They claim that the victim, the person who their client killed or assaulted, made a sexual advance, and this prompted an uncontrollable reaction of panic and rage, and therefore means that their client is not guilty, or at least less guilty. Legally speaking, there's three different ways that this can be justified. It can be a self-defense claim, as in, this person attacked me, I was in danger, so I was protecting myself. It can be a claim of provocation, meaning that the defendant had been exposed to something that would make a quote-unquote reasonable person lose their self-control, thus they're less morally responsible for their actions. 
or it can be what's called a diminished capacity claim, meaning my reaction of panic and rage was so extreme that I couldn't think clearly, a sort of temporary insanity. But whatever the rationale, it's a way of putting the victim on trial rather than the person who harmed them on the basis of them allegedly being gay. When do people typically use this during the legal process? This defense can be used at many different stages in the legal process. In some cases, charges are never brought at all against murders of queer folks because of it. In other cases, charges are reduced, say from murder to manslaughter, before trial. Or in other cases, it's used in trials to convince juries to acquit, to find someone not guilty. And then in some cases, it's used by judges as a basis for giving little or no punishment, even when someone is convicted. The trans panic defense, which has become more prominent in the last 20 or 30 years in particular, is a variation of this, in which a defendant claims that learning about someone's transgender status prompted a similar uncontrollable panic and rage, and so makes them less responsible for the violence that they commit against a trans person. A particularly horrifying example of this was in 2002 with the murder of Gwen Rojo. She was a young trans woman in California who was beaten to death by four young men, two of whom had previously had sexual interactions with her. The attorney for one of the young men uh, claimed in court that his client had been shocked beyond reason to find out that he had had sex with someone who was not a cis woman, and therefore his client should not be charged with murder, but manslaughter at worst. So it doesn't take much to see all the horrible places that this can go. In practice, it can function as a sort of blank check to get away with violence against LGBTQ folks, or even anyone who could be perceived as LGBTQ. It conveys to queer and trans folks that our lives are worthless, that the legal system doesn't care about us, and that if we're targets of violence, it's our fault. When was it first used? So we don't know exactly the first time it was used, but we know that it was being used regularly in the U.S. by at least the 1940s and 1950s. It has a tangled history that's kind of hard to parse out. I would recommend James Polchin's book, Indecent Advances, for this excellent prehistory of the gay panic defense and violence against queer men in the early 20th century. So the first time I can remember learning about the gay panic defense was when I looked into the history of Harvey Milk, who was one of the first openly gay elected officials in the country. He was also a city supervisor in my hometown of San Francisco, and he was assassinated in 1978 by Dan White, who successfully employed this defense. Tell us a little bit more about that. So the gay panic defense is one of, but by no means the only, way that anti-LGBTQ discrimination in the criminal legal system appears. So in 1978, as you mentioned, when Dan White murdered Harvey Milk and San Francisco Mayor George Moscone in cold blood, the following year, the jury accepted this particularly absurd argument by the defense that because Dan White had been depressed and eating a lot of junk food at the time of the murder, he was somehow less responsible for his actions. Critics called this the Twinkie defense. So as a result of this, Dan White was convicted not of murder, but of manslaughter, which sparked the White Knight Riots, which is the most intense LGBTQ uprising in U.S. history. Wait, more than Stonewall? Absolutely. And um, this is not up for debate. This is <laughs> factual history. Why, why is it considered the most, like, intense? Um, sure. So the White Knight Riots in 1979 involved thousands and thousands of mostly gay men and others uh, rioting in San Francisco, breaking the windows at City Hall, torching police cars, clashing with police. Um, it was an incredibly intense uprising. And it was sparked by the recognition that the uh, legal system didn't value the lives of queer people. That no matter how popular, well-loved in your community you were, even if you were an elected official, that your life wasn't safe. And that um, that really made an impression on the queer community at the time. So that was one of the many instances that really brought a lot of activist focus to bear on the question of anti-LGBTQ discrimination in the criminal legal system. At one point in the show, we hear Kevin Barrell, who was an important anti-violence activist through the 1980s, explain that simply being gay or lesbian made it much harder for a survivor of violence to win a case. And we see that super clearly in the case of the man who reported that Richard Rogers drugged and assaulted him in 1988. Lara was very brave to come forward, especially knowing that those kinds of cases where the tables are turned and the person who was attacked is, is now on the stand. The defense attorney basically claims that that's just normal kinky homosexual stuff and the judge acquits him. And that man was one of the very few who had the courage to speak up and try to hold his attacker accountable. 
So whether or not it's gay panic per se, there's all these examples from this time period of the way that anti-LGBTQ attitudes in the legal system make it so hard for people to hold their attackers accountable or for murders and violence to be taken seriously by the broader society. How did Richard Rogers use the gay panic defense? So in 1973, Richard Rogers murders his roommate, bludgeons him to death with a hammer, suffocates him with a bag over his head and dumps his body in the woods. He goes to trial. He's arrested on charges of murder. And in the courtroom, he basically claims, oh, my roommate made a sexual advance at me and I was just so freaked out that I had to kill him. And he's acquitted. He's acquitted. So on one level, this is a classic case of the gay panic defense in which someone who commits a murder gets away with it just by saying that the person is gay. But one of the things that's interesting about this case is Frederick Spencer, his roommate who he murdered, we have no information about Frederick Spencer's sexual orientation. We don't know what happened that day. But we know that Richard Rogers knew that he could say that in the courtroom to get away with murder. So regardless of the sexual orientations of the people involved, regardless of what actually happened, and none of us will ever know what happened on that day between the two of them, regardless of that, the anti-LGBTQ bias in the legal system and in the broader society made it possible for Richard Rogers to not only get away with murder in that particular moment, but to continue to get away with murder for decades. So I think that this is an example of how homophobia, even though it's obviously especially harmful to LGBTQ people, is actually harmful to everyone. One thing we can take from this case is that no matter what your sexual orientation is, you have a stake in ending anti-LGBTQ oppression in the legal system and in our society as a whole. It's especially fatal to gay and trans people, but it's a threat to all of us, and we all stand to benefit from working together to end it. What other topics did you consult on, and did you have a favorite topic of research? Mm. So my role as a historical consultant for the show involved a few different things. When I first got involved, I made a timeline to situate the events that we discuss in the show in a broader context of U.S. LGBTQ history. So looking at other examples of anti-gay, anti-lesbian, anti-trans violence, uh, other than the last call killers uh, murders. Also looking at developments in social movement and legislation in popular culture and things like that. So that in line with Howard and Anthony's vision for the show, we could not just be telling a story of an investigation and a bunch of murders, but a broader story about a community in our collective history over the last 50 years. So in addition to that, I would watch uh, drafts of the episodes as they came out and do some fact checking, do some research and um, make suggestions about ways that we can tie the past to things that are going on in the present day. So, for example, one character who pops up in the show a couple of times is Anita Bryant, who in the 1970s was a particularly virulent anti-gay activist who kind of, you know, helped launch the religious right as a political force. And trying to trace the through lines of some of the rhetoric that she helped create around homosexuals as threats to children, the idea of the Save Our Children campaign, which we see so concretely happening today in the so-called groomer discourse that um, is popping up around the country as well. So that stuff was really exciting to work on, to, to think about how can we make history relevant for the present day and the political moment that we're in. Can you tell us about some of the resources out there for listeners who might want to learn or do more and the impact campaign that HBO is doing along with the series? So... It's been a vision of the filmmakers from the beginning that this is not just ancient history and not just entertainment, that we want viewers to feel like watching this enables them to do something, to learn more, to take action. So in line with that intention, uh, HBO has been working on an impact campaign that's going to include a discussion guide for folks who want to do screenings for community groups or in the places where they live. That's going to have questions that dig deeper into some of the themes we've been discussing on the podcast and also resources for people who want to take action. So I can just name a couple of those. The Anti-Violence Project here in New York City is still around. They're a major character on the show and also uh, an important part of the LGBTQ activist landscape today. And they're a part of the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, which is a nationwide network of groups that do similar work to AVP in all parts of the country. So for folks who are specifically passionate about anti-violence work, we'd recommend you check out that national network and find ways to plug in in the place where you live. 
Here in New York City, organizations like Glitz, which Cayenne Dora Show, who's uh, featured on our show, helped to found uh, as an opportunity to support some of the most marginalized members of our community in securing safe housing and access to resources and leadership development, political advocacy. In terms of the gay and transpanic defense specifically, as of the time that we're recording this, there's about 15 states plus the District of Columbia who've passed laws banning the use of gay or trans panic defenses in court, beginning with California in 2014. Similar laws have been proposed on a national level in Congress and in about a dozen other states. On the legal level, that's certainly an important part of, the, of what needs to happen. But as awful as the gay and trans panic defenses are, I think that they're more of a symptom than a cause of anti-LGBTQ oppression. These legal strategies only make sense because LGBTQ people and our sexual desires and our gender identities are still widely seen as disgusting, inferior, or threatening. So in addition to laws that ban these practices from the legal system, the most important thing that I think we can do is fighting against stigma and oppression against LGBTQ people everywhere in all the different ways it shows up in our society. Humanizing victims and survivors of anti-LGBTQ violence, honoring our lives, including our sexualities and our genders, and fighting back against the onslaught of laws and social attitudes that demonize trans youth, drag performance, bathroom access, and so much more. These are all critical steps on the path to making gay and trans panic a thing of the past. Can I thank you so much for hopping on this side of the mic instead of being in the background? <laughs> thank you so much, Jamila. For our final interview of Last Call, we have lawyer and activist Chase Strangio. Thanks for joining me in the studio, Chase. Thanks for having me. So we just heard from Nikita about the LGBT panic defense. Chase, tell us what other ways you've seen queer people specifically criminalized or dehumanized within the court system. Wow. I mean, I think it's sort of just the entirety of the court system would be set up to dehumanize and criminalize human beings in general. Uh, you know, it's a system that derives from our constitutional structure, which is in and of itself founded on exploitation, chattel slavery, indigenous genocide. So you can't really think or talk about the courts and especially criminal law without thinking about dehumanization generally. And then within that, there are all the ways that gender variance has been criminalized, where same-sex intimacy has been criminalized. And so all of these things are interactive in nature. And when you think about the court system, everything from the theater of the court to how juries operate, to how judges operate, to how lawyers operate, is infused with that type of anti-LGBTQ bias, the white supremacy, the patriarchy, and all of that, of course, is impossible to disaggregate from the system itself. Chase, you started working at the ACLU in 2013, and now it's 2023. We're in a moment where there are anti-trans laws making their way through courts and legislators, and a lot of the rhetoric around why people are pushing these laws is that they are supposed to protect children. Of course, this reminds us of Anita Bryant and her so-called Save Our Children campaign from the 1970s. What makes rhetoric like this so cyclical and how can we stop that cycle? Yeah, you know, one of the things that's so jarring about this moment is that you hear a lot of cisgender straight people and unfortunately cisgender queer people talking about, well, something about transness is uniquely deviant or uniquely problematic. And that's why we're seeing this type of escalation of engagement targeting our communities and that what we need is to separate the LGB from the T as if the exact same thing didn't happen before, particularly targeting cisgender gay people and Anita Bryant's entire paradigm of calling gay people generally groomers, of saying that gay people were a threat to children is what's reemerging now in the form of this anti-trans, anti-drag discourse. And in some ways, it's not just limited to the way in which LGBTQ people are targeted, especially if you think about the history of the United States positing individuals, communities, or actions as a threat to, in particular, white children. In that sense, it's it's cyclical because it's endemic to the system. It's the way in which the system justifies itself. And in this moment where we're seeing this ex extensive attack on the trans community, on gender variance in general, on LGBTQ people more broadly, it's of course going to be this discourse that reemerges, this idea that somehow our bodies and our lives are a threat to children. Of course, there are 
LGBTQ children and particularly trans children. Uh, Of course, there are individuals who, uh, you know, sort of exist and and are sort of posited as a threat to themselves. And so the entire thing is nonsensical. It's counterfactual. But because of the way in which it's repeated through this type of rhetoric, it's incredibly effective in expanding the power of the state, expanding the reach of the criminal law. And that is what we're seeing in this in this current moment. And it's so important to connect it to Anita Bryant, to connect it going back, because this is not a new idea. So you've sort of become uh, the face or a face of resistance to a lot of these anti-trans legal attacks that are happening. And I just want to ask, what's it like being in the public eye and how do you feel about being that spokesperson? Well, yeah, so it's definitely not my intention. And and I think that I'm like have very deeply Scorpio private sensibilities and it is very counter to sort of everything that I imagined for myself. Um, and, and perhaps it was it was a product of being at a large organization at a moment when there was a shift from 2015 to 2016, which was after the Supreme Court struck down bans on marriage equality. And of course, a lot of the attacks on the LGBTQ community had shifted from attacking same-sex marriage to focusing on on trans people, on trans bodies in the, in the public. And I was at the ACLU. I was representing Ch- Chelsea Manning. And so I was sort of positioned in a way uh, as a trans litigator in a large organization to be fighting back against these newly introduced laws, in particular the anti-trans bathroom laws in, in 2016. And, and I was so frustrated with our lack of tools to push back. It was a huge movement with a lot of resources that had done no investment in supporting the trans community. And there were, you know, a very small number of trans litigators who were pushing back and leading the litigation at that time. And and so I was just sort of happenstance in that position. And in my frustration, I started to, to sort of feel that I needed to use my own life, my own experiences as a, as a tool of resistance because I felt frustrated. And, and that sort of, it, it spiraled over the last seven years in ways that, um, you know, to be honest, I, I sometimes wish I could just go back and not do it because I don't like being someone who's associated in this way with the work. I, I don't like being attacked all the time. Um, and and it's it's just it's just getting more and more, unfortunately. And so if we think about what is it what is it like moving forward? I don't I, I don't feel I mean, I, I love the work and I would never I, I never feel like I'll, I'll, I'll have an interest or desire to step away. But being so closely correlated with it at a time of such unbelievable escalation, um, I will admit, is not something that I would uh, <laughs> wish on my worst enemies. <laughs> well, I mean, so thank you for one for being so candid about sort of the struggles with that. Uh, how do you take care of yourself so you don't want to leave the work? Um, I mean, I, I mean, for me, it's like at the end of the day, I'm always going to find a way to have fun. Um, like if we're not laughing, if we're not making it ridiculous, if we're not, you know, making it a stunt on some level, then like it's not queer to me. It's not something that's sustainable. So even in the most just dismal moments that, you know, if I'm like traveling all around or doing things that are demoralizing, I will, I will just relish in the ability to be with queer and trans people. I spend my life around queer and trans people. It is my preference. Um, and so that, you know, it, it's always going to be fun for me on some level, even in those moments. Like, I will find a, a way and and I do find it intellectually stimulating. It's, it's you know, I, I like having some amount of control. When you look at the world and, and see your community under assault and you have a tool at your disposal and you can think about, well, what are we going to do to fight back? You know, when, when there is a bad decision against us or there's a horrible bill that's passed, it, it feels empowering to me to be able to have something to do. It feels empowering to me to be able to craft some of the arguments that we present in court And one of the things I've been thinking a lot about lately is having the ability as a trans person to confront the people who are very invested in our eradication just right in their face. And whether that's cross-examining a so-called expert in court or showing up in court, uh, you know, against these attorneys general who would, you know, defend these laws. um, I want to be an unnerving, disarming reminder of our fullness as a community. Um, And that keeps me going, even if it is somewhat exhausting. Okay, so in episode four, uh, we skip ahead to 2005, which is when Richard Rogers is on trial for murder, uh, for these four murders. 
that are described in the show. Of course, this is not his first time ever in his life being on trial for murder. He was tried first in 1973. We talked earlier about how he successfully used the gay panic defense. This time to sort of jump ahead of that, the prosecution employs a questionnaire to sort of gauge the levels of homophobia within the jury. I think sort of the most queer friendly one could be on that questionnaire is live and let live. Um, it, it seems like a really imperfect tool, um, but it's also an important one in this instance. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, well, I've so I've never done a jury trial. I mean, I'm, I have no personal experience of sort of doing voir dire and assessing a jury pool. But I think as a matter of just assessing human behavior, it's just a, it's it's a totally incomplete tool, and and it doesn't account for all of the ways that people try to trick themselves into sort of. Uh, assessing whether or not they carry bias. If you have any awareness of what you're doing, of course, you may have different incentives. You may have incentive to appear more homophobic. You may have an incentive to appear less homophobic. It's just a totally and completely imperfect tool. And of course, juries are imperfect tools um, because human beings are so complicated and the way in which we assess human behavior is complicated. This questionnaire is just a really good illustration of what we deal with. If the best we can get is live and let live, that is such a low bar. What would justice look like for victims in the case of Richard Rogers? Yeah, I mean, so I'm someone who comes at this where, you know, justice is never going to be found in the courtroom. Um, I just don't see that as our our pathway. And if we think about, you know, the the different ways in which Richard Rogers interfaces with the state that ultimately allows for the continuation of violence. These are structural problems, not individual ones. And I think that when we over rely on the legal system, then we end up having interventions like banning the gay and trans panic defense. And that is something that we see the movement focused on and something that I personally am not supportive of. Um, and the reason is because whether you whether you utilize this defense or not, that is what is going on in people's minds. We cannot change the contours of the so-called justice system if we don't change the contours of society. And if we think that taking away different tools from a criminal defendant is going to be the answer, we're we're A, taking away tools from criminal defendants, which has a host of other consequences, but B, has us focused on the wrong problem, in my view. So to me, justice is the change in cultural discourse. Justice is recognizing that violence is endemic in our society, and violence against LGBTQ people takes many forms, and that partly happens through individually perpetrated violence, through murders, like we like we see, you know, against Richard Rogers' victims, and then, of course, all of the other ways that particularly trans women of color, black trans women in particular, are murdered now. And then, of course, that's all the all the ways the state facilitates murder through taking away health care, through taking away housing, through making it impossible for people to survive. And those are the conversations I hope that we will be having, like, in society. So a slight pivot. What do you think of when you hear the term true crime? Or do you like true crime? Like, what what's your take on the whole thing? Oh, I mean, so I have this, I, I am like one of these people and it makes me feel like a suburban white woman. It's like, I like watching crime shows. I remember when I was studying for the bar, I was like, oh, and this isn't true crime, but I was like, if I watch Law & Order, it's fine because that's like studying for the bar. I'm like <laughs> learning my criminal law, which is of course not actually true, um, but it was part of my justification. And, and I think that in some sense, it's probably just like the lurid fascination um, and the way in which we are drawn to this idea. I mean, drawn to violence in general, especially in, in U.S. society, and that is troubling. I mean, I've never actually thought about, well, what is true crime? I mean, crime is itself a totally contrived and contingent subject. So there's nothing, you know, true about it. It's what we decide it is. But of course, if I think about, well, the genre of true crime and sort of looking at, uh, you know, violence through various lenses and how the law interfaces with it, there is something maybe as a lawyer, maybe as someone just living in the United States, maybe as someone who's really been insulated from criminalization in many ways that I've come to it with the sort of, uh, entertainment view, um, which which I think is, is probably very, very problematic. 
<laughs> so there have been media depictions of gay and trans killers for years, ranging from Cruising, Silence of the Lambs, Ace Ventura to Dahmer. How do these depictions affect the queer community? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually I thought that the way in which disclosure, the documentaries sort of traced the representation of of trans people in film and television was incredibly helpful for cisgender audiences, but for transgender audiences as, as well to sort of think about, well, what are all the ways we've internalized our own deviance, this idea that we are inherently criminal? Um, and it's important to sort of, again, anytime we think about criminality, remember that it's an it's a construct. It is that which society and, and thereby the law deems uh, to be the subject of control by the state in a particular way. There's not, it's not like there's some extra legal criminality. It's defined by the law, which is, of course, decided by the people who are in charge. Um, and so when you when you sort of position queer and trans people as criminal um, and when you have limited representation and then you only have that representation and you start to, uh, to sort of equate it in a definitional sense. So you have the constant representation of transness in particular and queerness to maybe a lesser extent as exclusively tied to deviance and criminality, then of course that reinforces in people's mind the reflexive notion that it is definitionally deviant. It is definitionally criminal. And that, of course, justifies both state violence and then extra legal violence. And it has a very, very damaging impact on the community. As a queer person who enjoys true crime, what kind of true crime would you like to see? I mean, I guess for me, if we, I would be interested in redefining the genre to look at the government's perpetration of crime. If you think about all of the ways that government actors, whether it's through legislative action, executive action, or even prosecutorial or policing action, have uh, caused violence against our communities, we could flip the lens. Um, And to me, that would be an important intervention to say criminality comes from the state as much as it comes from individuals that the state deems criminal um, and, and really understand that structural way that violence happens against our communities. Chase, thank you so much for joining me in the studio and for being willing to talk about this case. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great to chat with you about it. Me too. And that's it. This is the final episode of HBO's Last Call podcast. Thank you to our guests, Howard, Anthony, Nikita, and Chase. I'm Jamila King, and thank you for listening. HBO's Last Call podcast is a production of HBO Story Syndicate and Pineapple Street Studios. I'm your host, Jamila King. This episode was produced by Melissa Slaughter. Our producers are Ari Saperstein, Melissa Slaughter, and Megan Doherty. Our consulting producer is Nikita Shepard. Engineering and mixing by Pedro Alvira. Special thanks to Jade Brooks for additional engineering. Production music is courtesy of HBO. Gabrielle Lewis and Barry Finkel are our executive producers at Pineapple Street. From Story Syndicate, our executive producers are Kate Barry, Mala Chapel, Anthony Corona, and Howard Gertler. Special thanks to Michael Gluckstadt, Allison Cohen, and Savon Slater on the HBO podcast team. Chris Harnick, Deborah Coker, and Emily Janusa in HBO marketing. Maynard Kay, Lisa Gao, Eileen Holland and Tom Haskard in design, and Tina Nguyen and Allison Keough in HBO programming, and to series executive producers Charlize Theron, Matt Mayer, Beth Kono, and AJ Dix from Denver and Delilah. I'm Jamila King, and thank you for listening.